Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Welcome to this special edition of Econ Talk, recorded in front of a live audience here at the Hoover Institution's Washington office. Today is February 5th, 2014, and my guests are Charles Calamiris and Stephen Haber. Charles is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business, and he co-directs the Hoover Institution's Regulation and Rule of Law Research Initiative. Stephen Haber is the AA and Jean Welch Milligan Professor in the School of Humanities and Science at Stanford University and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Their book is Fragile by Design, The Political Origins of Banking Crises and Scarce Credit, which is our topic for today's episode. Charles and Stephen, welcome to Econ Talk. Great delight to be here. I want to start with the fundamental claim of the book. You reject the idea that bank crises are just bad luck or a perfect storm of random events. Rather, you argue that banking crises and systems are fragile by design. Steve, what do you mean by that claim and what's the justification for it? So the basic uh, idea of the book is that uh, banking systems are fragile by design because it is impossible to take politics out of bank regulation. And it's impossible to do so because there are inherent conflicts of interest between government and banking systems, such that banks need governments and governments need banks. Those conflicts of interest basically boil down to three features. First, governments simultaneously regulate banks and borrow from banks. Second, governments simultaneously use their police power in order to enforce debt contracts on behalf of banks. But people who, who are being, let's say, forced out of their houses um, by, um, because they've defaulted on a mortgage are voters. And so in, in, when banking crises occur, governments often have reasons to not enforce those debt contracts. Uh, third, um, Governments are in charge of liquidating failed banks, um, but the biggest group of um, creditors to a bank when a bank is liquidated are its depositors, who are voters. Um, and so governments have incentives to uh, change the rules governing deposit insurance uh, for political ends. That is, they'll often extend deposit insurance beyond its statutory limits. Um, because of those basic, uh, those three, sort of three basic inherent conflicts of interest, it's not it's it's extremely difficult um, to remove politics from banking. Governments have or uh, parties inside the government have an inherent um, reasons for wanting to use the banking system for their own ends. And at the same time, bankers need the government in order to do things like um, you know, enforce debt contracts. There's Finance. no getting politics out and financing wars. A lot of yes. your book is. Books a remarkable uh, history of of banking and the banking industry in five different countries, and uh, credible work of scholarship and economic history combined with the political economy that we're talking about. Now, Charles, I want to talk about the game of bank bargains, which is a central concept in the book. Tell us what that is and um, where it's. Uh, how do you apply it? The the game of bank bargains. It's a phrase that we invented to describe the fact that the outcome of the rules of the game of banking uh, reflects political alliances that are formed between always involving the parties that are in charge of the government and some other parties that ally together and form an alliance with the government to determine the rules of the game. So the point is that in the game of bank bargains, there's going to be a group of people who are in charge and there are going to be a group of people often who are left out and it won't be a big surprise to you that the people who are in charge will use their power in this game to take advantage of the people who are left out of course they're not a monolithic group they're going not to at be all fighting among themselves for their share of that 
Bye. No, and in fact, the key, and, and this is one insight that I think is important in the book. It's a little different from the way some political scientists think about um, political struggles, where they tend to think it's struggles between political parties. One of the points that we make in the book is that the coalitions that have been involved, let's say, in U.S. history uh, to design the rules of the game of banking have often been bipartisan. In fact, they purposely have structured themselves sure. to be fairly immune to electoral partisan outcomes. And so uh, it's just as you would expect. If you wanted to have a long-lived and valuable coalition, you would want it to be fairly robust to electoral outcomes. And so sometimes you get a very unlikely partnership. People who ideologically or culturally socioeconomically don't really see eye to eye at all, but find a <laughs> convenience in being allies in a particular arrangement. Yeah, my, my uh, the way I think of it is the Democrats and Republicans are the same. They both like to give money to their friends. They just have different friends, but they have one friend in common, which is the financial sector. And they are both tend to scratch that sector's back and get scratched back in return, which is another way of... I, I agree with you, but, but I would go even farther to mm -hmm. say that sometimes they may pretend to have different friends more than they really do. Yeah. yeah. You want to give us an example? Well, you know, we're going to, I'm sure, talk a little bit about the current U.S. crisis eventually. But one of the things yeah. I think is, is really interesting is that one of the contributors to the crisis was... Um, mortgage subsidization policies in the U.S. Encouragement to homeownership in all kinds of dimensions. But encouraging the homeownership precisely in a particular way by creating subsidies for taking risk in the mortgage market. You can encourage homeownership in a lot of ways. Correct. But what's interesting is when we look at the last, let's say, 15 years or so of that policy, what we see is um, George H.W. Bush, followed by Bill Clinton, followed by George W. Bush, followed by... Barack Obama, and even though you might think of those people as very different ideologically, they actually were part of a continuous uh, thread of very similar kinds of policies from the standpoint of some of the issues that we're talking about. And, and, you go ahead. In fact, you know, I would add to that that you know, in terms of the unlikely coalition members uh, that that sort of sit underneath these uh, bipartisan agreements, um, in in the case of the United States. We had activist groups allied to uh, bankers that were in the process of creating mega banks through the 1990s merger movement. Um, this, to the point that at Fed, Federal Reserve Board hearings about mergers, activists would show up, for example, from Acorn, and testify on behalf of the Bank of America merging with Nations Bank. Yeah. So this is not the usual roles that you would imagine an activist group taking vis-a-vis -vis a bank merger. So you've got these very unlikely partnerships that be, precisely because they straddled partisan lines were extremely durable and it made it very hard for any uh, party to deviate from the agreement. Yeah, it's um, an interesting coalition because as you point out, there are a lot of voters in these discussions. Those are the homeowners. There are clearly a lot of those, but in general in democracies, large groups don't get treated particularly well so when I see it as, as my somewhat cynical, perhaps realistic take is that they were a vehicle to give cover to giving money to these much smaller and politically powerful groups, the realtors, the home builders, and the banks who financed them through the political incentives that were inherent in the system. Well, they, they got everybody who was part of that winning coalition in the game of bank bargains did quite well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the total amount of subsidized credit that was uh, contractually agreed as a quid pro quo for those activist groups to show up at the merger hearings, which is an understatement of the amount they actually received, was almost $870 billion over the period 1992 to 2007. So that's not chump change. Now, we, we, we've, we've gotten into the weeds a little bit here, and I think we ought to maybe do a little bit of clarifying. You're talking about the Community Reinvestment Act, which we're going to I'm going to push back a little bit when we get to it in more detail. Sure. But we should just mention here that a lot of people who blame the Community Reinvestment Act for playing a role in the 2008 financial crisis uh, get challenged by saying, well, but that law was passed in 1977. But the teeth of the law really only took place in the early 1990s when it became 
the determinant of whether a bank could merge or not. And mm -hmm. that's when it started to have an impact. Right. Well, how big that impact is, we'll, we'll talk about. But right. I just want to get that get mm -hmm. that straight. Let's go back in the history a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and we'll start with the United States. I wish we had a five or six hour uh, podcast. <laughs> I know the well, authors we, do too, but we, we don't. don't. <laughs> uh, and I I know you'd all like to stay for that, but um, we're going to not be able to cover all the aspects of the of the book. But let's start with the U.S. and going back into the history of the United States. Uh, you talk about the 19th century uh, as a particular era of banking in the United States. Steve, tell us why the U.S. was so prone to crises. So a lot of people, when they look back at the 19th century, they say, oh, my gosh, it was bank run after crisis, after failure. Why was the U.S. so unstable in that era? The, the, so first, let me say I'm appalled and shocked that we don't have five hours. Okay. Uh, I had been counting on it. Um, <laughs> second, um, the, uh, to answer the more specific question, um, the U.S. in the 19th century has a banking structure unlike any other country on the planet. It has thousands of banks, thousands, thousands of banks, tens almost of thousands, right? In by the tw early 20th century, tens of thousands, yeah. um, which are in most states unable to open branches. So every bank is a every what you would think of as a branch is a bank unto itself. That means that um, in the event of a bank run, it's very hard to move funds from one branch to another because there aren't branches. It means you can't spread risk across regions that you're tied to the local economy. Um, and uh, it meant that banks couldn't capture scale economies in administration. So the banks are very inefficient. That it seems like a, all those things seem pretty obvious, right? So that, that they're inefficient, yes. that they're stuck with the local economy. Yes. Why? So there's a political deal that's underneath this. And essentially, you know, just like as we were talking about the coalition between populists and bankers and mega bankers in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, there's a coalition between small bankers and farmers in the 19th century. And what their concern is, is to get credit to small farmers. Um, and and the small farmers are also opposed to big city people, that is big city aristocrats, especially bankers. And so you get an alliance of small bankers and farmers against big bankers. Most particularly and, and famously, is the unraveling of the Bank of the United States. Uh, first in 1811, and then it gets refounded because central government realizes it needs a bank to uh, prosecute wars. And then it gets unraveled again during the Jacksonian period, the second Bank of the United States. Um, and, be, um, and so in, in order to make sure then that banks would not have to face competition in their markets, in the early years of bank regulation, um, in most uh, states, what happened is they made it illegal for a foreign bank to branch into your state, meaning a bank from Rhode Island couldn't branch into Massachusetts. Um, they also made it illegal for a bank to open a branch. And so most states had laws, except in the South, that precluded branch banking. The point we, we, were, we make in the book, that sort of the takeaway of this is, this was, you know, I'm sure somebody could write down an economic model in which this made sense, which you can write down lots of models, that was, a, that was a joke. Yeah, um, but, but this is clearly a political arrangement. Uh, there's there's sort of no efficiency or stability criteria by which you would do this. It did, however, work quite well for local unit bankers because they had captive local markets. Essentially, they ran local monopolies. And it worked well for relatively prosperous farmers in a particular community because they no, knew that that bank had to lend to them and nobody else because the cost of gathering information at a distance in the 19th century. In fact, even up until the 1990s, most bank lending in the United States is local, um, until the, really until the computer revolution. So that, that created this sort of cozy arrangement, good for the local farmers, good for in the North and the Midwest, good for unit bankers, bad for anybody else who wanted access to credit, and bad for the system as a whole, because about every decade there's a banking crisis. So it's hard to remember in a world that we live in where Agriculture is 2% or so of employment in the United States. In 1900, it's about 40%. Mm -hmm. So it's an important sector. The people who are the more important decision makers in that sector are going to be politically powerful in their region. But as we go forward from 19, well, really continually through the 20th century and starting at the end of the 19th, agriculture becomes less and less important as an economic industry, as an economic factor. Why didn't that coalition unravel sooner? We have branch banking. 
came around, I think, 1970 or so. So, Charles, why is it? It's a nice story, ex post, right? It's easy to tell a story after the fact. What explains why it, it didn't, why did it unravel and why didn't un, did it not unravel sooner? Well, I think it, first I want to emphasize how striking it is that it lasted for about 150 years. Um, so many things, there were lots of shocking things going on in the U.S. The Civil War, uh, two world wars, a Great Depression, yeah. a, a lot of uh, banking crises f during the late 19th and the early 20th century, uh, even the savings loan crisis in the 1980s which finally contributed toward its demise. But what's interesting is over 150 years of turmoil and inefficiency, it persisted. Now, part of the story is federalism in the U.S. Because starting from the very beginning, the states had authority over the deciding what the rules of the game of engagement for banking were going to be within their states and also, they had the authority to restrict out-of-state banks from participating. So that meant that if you were in, let's say, Kansas or Illinois or, or many other such states, if the agricultural interests there wanted to maintain unit banking, they just had to win the battle at the state level. True. And so it was a lot easier for those agricultural interests to win the battle at the 50 state levels than it would have been if they had had to fight that battle on a centralized basis. Uh, and we, we make that argument uh, sort of at length in the book why that is. And in contrast, in particular, one of the things that explains why the U.S. had such a hard time getting a nationwide branch banking system going was that decision making about the law was at the level of the individual banks. And then in the 1860s, we create the national banking system. It sounds like something the federal government's going to do that could have been a nationwide banking system like the Bank of the United mm -hmm. States or the Second Bank were. But what happens is the comptroller of the currency and Congress probably would have not let the comptroller decide differently. But the comptroller decided that national banks had to be unit banks. Mm -hmm. And then... The unit bank is a meeting one... One building, basically. Right. right. Yeah. So national banks were the national bank of out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. And then what was national about it besides the it's, the, the, the charters? The charters were the same. Uh -huh. uh, they were operating under the same rules, okay. uh, under the same chartering authority, under the same supervisory authority. But they were cheese and chalk in terms of the business they did, because one is in a city, one is in the country. And they had, as Steve pointed out earlier, very particular risks, too. They couldn't diversify across regions. Um, so the U.S. was, as everyone understood, I mean, practically making fun of us, uh, Canada especially, mm -hmm. looking at the United States and saying, you know, what a ridiculous banking system these people have. But it persisted because it was actually pretty challenging to create a nationwide branch banking movement in an environment of political decision making that was so fragmented. So one of the reasons that doesn't unravel immediately or earlier, and I'll let you take this, Steve, is the establishment of the Federal Reserve, which was, uh, uh, I think a lot of people think of the establishment of the Fed, the Central Bank of the United States, as sort of a, well, bankers, and you know, they get greedy, and they people get greedy, and they get out of control, they run amok, and then you need somebody to clean up the mess. Neglecting the fact that the mess was sort of baked in, as I think you use that phrase, in the fact that there was this unit banking system. So the Fed in, politically was a way to mitigate some of the worst effects of this system and keep it going longer than it would have. Is that correct, Steve? That is correct. I mean, what, what's interesting about the Fed is it has to be understood as a reaction to the panic of 1907-1908. And um, there's a National Monetary Commission which is created to look into how to fix the banking system. One option they had, in fact, they studied the banking systems of other countries, including Mexico, which had branches of two of the largest banks who were allowed to, to branch nationwide. Um, so they studied Canada, they studied Mexico, they studied Germany. Um, um, they were quite aware of what the other models were. And then they rejected all those models uh, in favor of retaining unit banking, um, but propping it up by creating 12 regional Fed banks that could essentially lend to unit banks by increasing liquidity 
in times of crisis. Essentially a safety net for them. Essentially a safety net for unit banking. And I, I point out the same thing happens in the Great Depression, where I'm sure everybody is, remembers their high school textbook, which, which talks about how um, the New Deal saved the banking system by creating deposit insurance uh, and creating the Glass-Steagall Act. Um, what they don't remember is that well, it's not in the textbook. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, actually, I helped my st daughter study for the AP U.S. It, it, history test. It was actually in there. Did you do well on that exam, by the way? I got a four. Uh, I did not. <laughs> I, when my daughter took the AP history exam, I panicked because I thought, I'm, I'm getting a two here, and I'm, I'm going to hurt her chances. I, I had a different perspective. Than, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I usually did bad at English classes, so uh -huh. if I'd help my daughter write a paper for her English course, she'd get a B minus. Yeah. So my daughter's decided my father doesn't know how to write. But she's <laughs> probably right. Um, in any case, in the, in the Great Depression, um, not only did my, my sort of forebears also get bees in English, but um, the, uh, the response was, again, to prop up the unit banking system. Yeah. Um, should classic, have ended it. Realistically, yes. it could have, the, history could have turned out very differently because said this system was incredibly messed up. We had thousands of banks fail. We need a different system. And instead, they said, let's choose, let's move this lever. And yeah, in, in order to prevent the consolidation of banks, which is what would have happened in right. the absence yeah. of, for example, deposit insurance and Regulation Q, which made it illegal to pay interest on checking accounts and capped the interest rates that could be paid on savings accounts. This was all done to discourage banks from competing with one another and done to discourage people from moving their savings from one bank uh, to another. Um, it, and what I want to drive across here is, again, it was a Coming back to something Charlie said, there's a, the coalition of agrarian populists and unit bankers is what drives that decision. FDR was against deposit insurance. Yeah. Carter Glass, and, who had he was governor of New York, right? He, mm -hmm. he and when he was running for president, he yeah. said, "Explain why why he was against it. It's very important." I Go ahead, Charlie. To understand that. Well, actually, uh, he when he was running for president in 1932, he said deposit insurance would make banks riskier because protected banks would take excessive risks. Uh, onto something that, well, of course, uh, this is we in insurance we call that the moral hazard problem. Mm -hmm. When you insure someone against risk, they tend to take more risk. So uh, he was, as I'll let Steve continue. He was definitely against it, um, as was the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. by the way, um, as was the Treasury Department, mm -hmm. as was Carter Glass, the uh, who had been the architect, one of the architects of the Fed originally, and was the architect of banking reform, some of the banking reforms during the 1930s. Um, but uh, maybe I'll let Steve carry on. But mm -hmm. someone was in favor of it. Yeah. yeah. And so the someone is uh, Henry Stiegel, who's a congressman from Alabama and who's chairing the House Banking Committee. And he is determined to protect the union bankers. And he rams deposit insurance through um, at the last minute. And it's what's interesting about it is um, it's put in place as, was, as a temporary measure that was only supposed to affect uh, very small deposits. And then a few years later, it's log rolled and made far more expansive. Um, Do we know anything about his personal life? Why, why was he a champion of unit banking? Was he a, uh, why was he their friend? What was his, what's going on there? Do we know? Well, there were, there were some politicians going back, uh, you know, you, you, we'll call them the agrarian populist politicians. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, mm -hmm. going back to the 19th century. Sure. And Henry Stiegel was, and Huey Long, were politicians in the 30s that were cut from that same cloth. Their constituents were, the, especially their, their most important supporters, uh, landowners who in, in uh, environments that had small unit banks that were particularly shaky. So the thing, as Steve pointed out, if you have only small deposits protected, that means you're going to have a very big protection for small banks located in Alabama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if but New York City banks, almost none of their deposits were protected because the protection was only on small deposits. So now you might be able to understand better why Henry Stiegel liked federal deposit sure. insurance. He had a few friends, too. But, but it was clearly a transferring mm -hmm. mechanism from uh, city banks to small country banks. So if you're uh, an Alabama politician, it looks pretty good. There were 150 attempts from 1884 until ultimately 1933 to bring the federal deposit insurance legislation forward, and they were all done by similar people under similar circumstances. They never got out of committee uh, 
um, until finally in the 1930s. So why did this populist agrarian coalition fall apart ultimately? Well, well, there's a couple of pieces, and I think we can bounce back and forth about this. One of them is it was inconsistent with technological changes that were occurring in the, uh, in the banking industry. Um, you all remember the uh, – well, actually, you, you guys are too young. I remember – um, the introduction of the Which first, uh, no, uh, the, the people oh, okay. out there in the audience, we're all the same. Yeah. Uh, we all grew up in the days of disco. Um, and you'll remember <laughs> that, that the 1970s were famous both for disco and the invention of the networked ATM. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting, so the networked ATM and the computer technology that goes with it allowed for two things. First, computer technology allowed bankers to assess borrowers at a distance. They weren't sealed into a local unit bank. But it also meant that banks could skirt the laws governing branching by simply opening up an ATM anywhere they could rent six square feet of space. Like a very small branch. Yes. <laughs> In fact, the unit banks took the big banks to court over this, claiming that the, uh, that the opening of a networked ATM violated sure. the law. Those lawsuits went all the way to the Supreme Court, which finally in 1985 ruled that an ATM was not a, a branch bank. Second piece of this um, uh, had to do um, with the fact that um, a system in which <clears throat> there are um, regulations governing the interest rates that banks can pay, Regulation Q, only works at a time when inflation is very low. And so certainly in the 19 50s and the early 1960s, the U.S. is characterized by quite low inflation. Beginning in the later 1960s and especially through the 1970s, um, the government is running, big, starting to run big deficits to simultaneously prosecute the war in poverty and the war in Vietnam. As inflation climbs up, interest rates paid on bank deposits become strongly negative. Um, even postmodern English professors understand that under those circumstances, you should take your money out of a bank and move it into another vehicle. Um, and, um, and so you see the uh, deposits leaving the banking system in mass, going into money market mutual funds and the, and the like. Uh, the third part of this. Um, and which put banks in great difficulty because yes. they now didn't have the flow of funds. Right. They needed to pay off the promises they'd already made. And, right. Yeah. This precipitates something that Charlie's written quite a lot about, which is the savings and loan crisis of the 80s, which is the death knell of the of the unit bank. Um, you know, we think of the SNL crisis as a be about a being about savings and loans institutions, but it's also about not just savings and loans institutions. It's about lots of small banks which are heavily invested in real estate, um, and the, both the technological changes and the pressures that are put on the banks by virtue of the fact that they're competing in a very difficult environment and now having to take big big risks, so precipitates, there's also some, a, a, a number of shocks, precipitates the SNL crisis. And it's not until the resolution of the SNL crisis that uh, both state governments and the federal government begin to seriously reconsider the wisdom of the unit banking system. Charles, you want to jump it's on? interesting to compare and contrast the savings and loan crisis's mm -hmm. effect with the effect of the 1920s and the 1930s, which were also times when lots of banks were failing. Uh, and what's interesting is I think if Henry Stiegel and those people hadn't intervened, we had already seen in the 1920s almost 20 states uh, from the 1920 until 1939 had relaxed their branch banking restrictions. And we saw exactly the same thing happening at the state level from 1979 until the early 90s. What, what's when banks get weakened and states start seeing a lot of banks failing, they start thinking, well, maybe allowing a uh, nation's bank to come in from uh, another state Charlotte, might yeah. be worth doing. And then the FDIC says, well, that makes sense to us, too, because that could reduce our costs of having to support that failed bank. And so what's interesting is that didn't work in the 20s and the 30s. It got pushed back by Stiegel. But in the 1980s, in the 1990s, it did work. Part of the story mm -hmm. is demographics, um, that Much so many people, there weren't that ma as many people who were part of that agrarian coalition anymore. Uh, part of the story S Steve mentioned was the ATMs uh, and th that Supreme Court decision. I think there are, we could go into a lot of other elements, but one very important element was that 
Uh, the U.S. banks at this point internationally, we're getting globalization's beginning, globalization of finance. And the U.S. banks are losing market share in the 80s, not just outside the United States in international banking, but even within the United States. So we're starting to see major entry. You, you may not remember this th that happened, but in the early 80s, Japanese banks, German banks, uh, British banks are entering the U.S. And it's starting to look like uh, we're really going to become a bit player in the global drama of banking. And Alan Greenspan articulates this problem. And I think that many people are realizing that the U.S., if it wants to continue to be a global player, has to get serious about creating an efficient banking system. All these pieces are kind of coming together at the same time and finally pushing us to a different outcome, which now, of course, is irreversible because we have the federal law in 1994 um, and branch banking is, is, once it happens, you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So let's move north and let's go to Canada and tell us why how different Canada's experience is from the United States and why that is the case. So why don't you continue? What, 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 what happened in Canada? Well, um, it's rather for, remarkable. first, the, the most important thing to say about Canada is what didn't happen. You know, Canada is a very boring place. Thank God. Sure. From a banking uh, standpoint. No, first, from, we slammed the postmodern English professor. No, he no. Knows how to, hardly knows how to invest except in less than desperate straits. And now you're making fun of our Canadian. No, no, no. Or? I'm not making it. Sometimes boring is good. Okay? okay. So Canada never has a banking crisis. Ever. Ever. <laughs> so they, in 1837 and 1839, some of the problems in the U.S. banking crises that were sweeping the whole country here created a couple of weeks of minor disruption in Canada, but no bank failures and no problems. So Canada has never had a banking crisis. This recent subprime turmoil didn't cause a crisis in Canada. The Great Depression didn't. The 1830s when, didn't. When you say didn't cause a crisis, it's not just that, that their banking industry weathered the Great Depression better than ours. Did They had virtually no failures? No failures from any bank of any significance. And banks did fail. Small banks failed in Canada uh, occasionally, but it was... Mismanagement. Right, yeah. mismanagement. Uh, so uh, another interesting thing is not only did they have no bank failures, but their total amount of credit relative to GDP was either comparable to or better than the U.S. during this history, despite the fact that they had a lesser density of population and other things that might make you expect a very different outcome. Uh, so they had more abundant credit, more stable credit. And by the way, uh, analyses of how competitive the banking system is also show that it was more competitive. So it's really quite a, a remarkable difference. Uh, and I should mention also... Just all, a lot, probably. Well, and let me point something else out. Canada didn't even create a central bank, like a Federal Reserve sort of system, until 1935. So it wasn't that it, it was a particular sort of wise um, central banking policy that explains either. They didn't have deposit insurance until much more recently than, than the U.S. So it's really a story about a particular um, set of rules for engagement in Canada. Now, part of that, myself included in, in the past, people looked at this and said, well, that's because Canada had nationwide branch banking. And of course, it, that made and it hockey. much... And hockey. <laughs> But oh, nationwide branch banking hockey. was much more efficient, much greater diversification of risk. All those things are true. But, you know, as we've just learned in our own crisis, nationwide yeah. branch banking doesn't always give you stability. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we spend a lot of time in the book asking the question, what was it about Canada that made the political rules of the game in banking so successful? And when we dug deeply into that, we found that there was a lot to, to be uncovered. In the political history. Tell some of it. Well, I think that, you know, one of the fundamental differences when you look at sort of the basic institutional structure of Canada and the United States is that the United States is founded as 13 independent colonies. Um, nobody imagines anything other than 13 sovereign states which will be brought together in some kind of a union. And the, and the debate in the, 19th, the 18th and 19th century is how strong the central government will be. Um, in Canada, um, there's a basic geographical dis difference. 
All 13 colonies in the United States faced the seaboard, and so any one of them could trade directly with England. In Canada, the best agricultural lands and the timber resources are in the center of the country, in what's present-day Ontario. The, in order to get out to the sea, you have to pass along the St. Lawrence River, which goes through Quebec. We tend to forget it today, but at the time that the French pushed the, the the, the English pushed the French out of, out of Canada. Canada is over 90% French speaking. That creates a very difficult problem for the British colonists and for the British government, which is trying to create a viable colony out of Canada so that it doesn't meet the same fate that the British colonies in the United States met. met. It's got to give sort of rights of suffrage to the population, and at the same time, it's got to limit the numerical power of the French in Quebec, who occupy a key geographic position along the St. Lawrence River, because right in front of the city of Montreal are the Lachine Rapids, which meant you had to build a canal around the rapids. But if the French wanted to hold up British commerce and development in the interior of the country, all they had to do was block canal development. And in fact, the British merchants in the interior of the country complain about this repeatedly. That means that along and the short of it, and we spend a lot of time in the book talking about these sort of basic, how basic geography drives institutions, and those basic institutions then drive the banking system. That drives a centralization of bank chartering authority in Canada in the central government. It drives, this is in the 1860s when uh, Canada uh, is given sovereignty. It also drives a decision in Canada that all legislation or all authority not specifically given to the provinces goes to the central government, exactly the opposite of the United States, where all powers not vested in central government by default go to the states. It also, at the time of the Dominion Act, gives um, explicit rules that state that the central government will be uh, in charge of banking policy. So right from the very beginning, they go down a very different route from the U.S. They go down that different route in large part for some geographic or geopolitical reasons internal to Canada. Um, and they then create a set of institutions that are designed to um, make sure that the French cannot block Canada's development. Uh, they essentially um, disenfranchise the French population. And the, the way they do this is in the Senate, which is an unelected and is still an unelected upper house. Uh, initially, senators in Canada served for life. They now only serve to age 75. Um, but, um, enough for government work. And uh, yeah. they still actually, <coughs> unlike the British House of Lords, have veto power over legislation. And if you look at the history of Canadian banking, there are key moments where legislation that would have, for example, uh, created uh, a step towards deposit insurance are blocked in the Senate and key moments where there's sort of an impetus towards unit banking, and they're getting blocked in the Senate. In fact, every one of the sort of populist waves mm -hmm. that's happening in the U.S., where banking issues are being brought to the fore, they're happening in, in parallel in Canada. The difference is that those groups lose in Canada because they can't cobble together enough political support within that centralized and sort of blocked uh, political arrangement, but they win in the U.S., and that's that's what's so interesting. So this to me is, is one of the key insights of this book, and this this whole approach, which economists have a, I think, a tendency to to see finance as they see many things. It's, essentially, it, it's just a, it's a mathematical problem. It's an engineering problem. You just have to figure out what the right incentives are. We just have to fix it, and they tend to ignore the political side. So if you heard this story, if you're thinking about well. The United States has all these crises, bank runs, failures, disasters. Canada has this fabulous run of great success. Well, now we know what to do. We'll just be like Canada. We'll just, just give me your statutes and we'll just put those in place. And I think a lot of times economists make that mistake. They say, well, we know what the right solution is. We're going to advocate for that. And it's not just that it's, in, quote, impractical or it's too theoretical. They're missing what's fundamentally going on in which you highlight in the book, which is so, Charles, explain why it is that we don't, you know, everybody wants a stable banking system, right? So why don't we just go to Canada and say, okay, we'll do use theirs. Why doesn't that happen? Well, 
as I was explained to one person who asked me that question once, I said, well, would you, how would you feel about the idea that we would have our senators appointed by the Queen of England? <laughs> and, it's a negative problem. And they, they, that was <laughs> inconceivable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the reason it's inconceivable is this is a country that was born from troublemakers, right? I mean, you, it was mm -hmm. it, uh, the yeoman farmers armed to the teeth. Uh, from the very beginning, who created a revolution and weren't about to not uh, be vested with authority in a particular way. But Canada is a country that was designed by people to avoid a revolution, that created institutions that specifically made it a the quintessential classical liberal democracy, meaning that it created all of these barriers to various kinds of special interest or ma even majoritarian tyranny. Uh, and in fact, as, as Steve said, it's ironic that the UK, which gives up the voting power over money legislation of the House of Lords in 1911, Canada's Senate was modeled on that. But Canada's Senate persists. Uh, the House of Lords is pretty much emasculated in 1911. Mm -hmm. in so, yes. Yeah. So, so what's so interesting is um, the whole history of Canada, of course, is a history of people trying to prevent certain bad things from happening. Uh, we've got to get Brits to migrate to Canada, so we have to give them enough democracy. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to migrate to Canada if the French are blocking everything, so we have to create democracy that's not going to be a French tyranny. Also, there were lots of, we wanted to get uh, people to migrate from the United States mm -hmm. to Canada. They had quite a few royalists leaving in the early 19th century to Canada. So. It's a it's an environment of people who are trying to find a way to have a democracy, to have freedom, but to still be within uh, the British Empire. But that's the positive story to tell, way yeah. to tell it. Let me let me give the negative story. So any reform of the U.S. financial system that takes large sums of money away from people who are already getting those large sums is not likely to be successful, barring some radical change in the political incentives. Do you agree, Steve? I think there's always been a temptation. And certainly since the 1970s in the United States, to look to the banking system as a vehicle for income redistribution off balance sheet. Yeah. So okay. rather than oh, read exactly yeah. the U.S. government. Yeah. Um, that temptation is has been large for governments, regardless of their ideological stripe, uh, and for parties, regardless of their stated ideologies. Um, that makes the, it's that basic problem, right, that no party really wants to give up on this. There's parts of the Republican Party that do. They say they do. And I believe them, okay? But it's not as if, but that's not a, that's not a winning coalition. The, the, um, the fundamental problem facing sort of, you know, the creation, I think, today of um, a stable system of banking in the United States is that bank rules are arcane, hard for the public to understand. Coalitions can get created designed to channel, to share the um, credit or to channel credit to particular groups. Those rules are going to apply to everybody because you know, we're in a democracy after all. And that's going to distort everybody's incentives, borrowers and bankers. The result is that the U.S. is set up um, because of its sort of long tradition of populism, um, set up to be crisis prone, and it's a, I think a paradox to the United States. One of the one of the things I, I admire most about the history of our country is it's a history of troublemakers, right? These were you know farmers who were willing to go toe to toe with the British Army. That took a lot of guts. Yep. Um, that didn't happen in Canada. One morning people woke up and they said, "Oh, we're independent." Oh, what does that mean? Well, we'll still have tea. So, you know, independence wouldn't have occurred in Canada was a, you know, a, something of a snore. Um, you know, they celebrate the fact that they beat us in the War of 1812, uh, not their independence from England, right? Um, that means that in the U.S., precisely because we have this sort of paradoxical history of populism, which we simultaneously admire, but which generates this sort of... Um, uh, use of the banking system for redistributive purposes, um, that creates this, this sort of urge by politicians to redistribute rather through, 
rather than using the fiscal system, using the banking system. And because it occurs off the budget, and because it occurs in a way that is very hard for the average person to understand, and because it's not, you don't have to pay for the bill until the banking crisis occurs and everyone needs a bailout, it's not seen. And so there's a, a very strong temptation to do this. If I can just build on that briefly, one of the interesting things uh, about the U.S. is that all of these checks and balances that we're all trained in in grade school, what are we taught? Well, the U.S. is the liberal democracy because we have all these checks and balances. But those checks and balances often do work to thwart fiscal policy to address issues like inequality. But then there's still a lot of freedom to do things in a hidden way, off balance sheet. The support of the GSEs, mm -hmm. the, the use of the use of government sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the, the creation of regulation. Most people don't understand the arcane aspects of bank regulation to understand whatever implicit transfers and taxes are involved in that regulation. So that means that if, if you are an ideologically uh, Republican representative who wouldn't want to be associated with a particular transfer, you're safe. Because nobody knows it's Because nobody knows it's going. And then you can do your deal in a hidden way. So it, ironically, I think a lot of people that have put faith in the checks and balances of the U.S. system are missing the fact that particularly in the area of banking regulation, which is very big and very important, that that's an area where we have sort of addressed problems, especially inequality problems. Instead of addressing them head on, uh, we've addressed them in this very destructive way of using subsidies through the financial system, which tend to destabilize the system as, as the way to do it. You know, even if you're looking at housing policy, Australia, which is a unicameral uh, legislature, um, is, is a country that has also been very stable in terms of its financial system. But Australia is, in many ways, a populist country. And Australia addresses issues of inequality directly through fiscal policy. So, for example, what's affordable housing pro uh, policy in Australia? It's giving down payment assistance to first-time homeowners. Um, that, by the way, creates instability. I'm sorry, creates stability because it subsidizes more down payment, which tends to stabilize the housing market. What we do is, because we have to do it through the back door, we do the only thing that we can do, which is to subsidize instability by subsidizing leverage. Yeah. So the, the point is, there are some uh, flaws, I would say. I don't want to uh, be too judgmental here, but I would say there's some flaws in the way uh, we address certain problems that kind of push us, as Steve was pointing out, in the direction of using this hidden stuff, and it's always coming through the financial arrangement. Well, just to echo that, I, mean, I, I find it remarkable how little we've learned from the financial crisis in terms of these type of backdoor hidden subsidies. Um, the left has pushed back against any attempt to stop subsidizing mortgages. I mean, basically right now we have the Federal Reserve financing the mortgage market of the United States. This is not exactly what the founders of the Federal Reserve had in mind. It's not what most people would say is good economic policy, but it's politically very attractive to do that, and it's nuts, <laughs> uh, it seems to me. But let's, let's talk about the crisis because I, I want to let you put your – explanation on the table, and then I, I do want to push back against a little bit. You put a lot of stock, to my surprise, in the Community Reinvestment Act and the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You do, they certainly were part of the problem, but you don't talk much about the large private investment banks that issued private mortgage-backed securities, which were an enormously large part of the run-up in the early 2000s. And to me, without, without that, we would have had Maybe an unpleasant system. We might have had Fannie Mae go broke, but a lot of the the loans that were made were not made by loans under the Community Reinvestment Act, and it seems to me that the moral hazard problem is a bigger problem as a cause. And to me, the housing market is just the place it oozed out into. Could have been something else. Uh, defend yourself. You can go. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll, I'll start, and then um, Charlie will finish. All right. So I, I think it's important to get the the chronology of the facts straight. As you mentioned, the private investment banks get in uh, in the early 2000s into the MBS market. With the, two feet. They yeah. Just oh, yeah. Like, they see, they they see a market opportunity that Fannie and Freddie blazed for them 
going back to the 1992 GSE Act. The, um, that act has several curious features, one of which was it told Fannie and Freddie that they had to purchase lo repurchase loans from banks that met uh, affordable housing standard criteria. They had to lend a lot of money to poor people in, bad, in poor neighborhoods that weren't getting Up until 1992, money. total CRA lending is only $8.8 .8 .8 billion. A lot of agreements between activist groups and banks, but very little lending. Beginning in 92, and incidentally, this is, in, this is legislation which is crafted under the first Bush administration. Right. And I will be yeah. clear here, this is not a Democrat-Republican issue. Um, the, the basic problem that the community banks have, or excuse me, the community groups have, is what they want to do is get access to more credit, credit ch channeled through their organizations to their constituents. Quite reasonably, that's their, that's their, job. That's their stated job. That's what they're trying to do. Banks want to merge. In order to get approval for mergers, and we, we, I think from the vantage point of today, we don't have a sense of how rapid fire and dramatic these mergers are. Um, uh, Bank of America is essentially the, the amalgamation of 37 different banks in the 1990s. So in order to get approval for these mergers, they have to go before the Federal Reserve Board. Community activists show up at those merger hearings and say that they can block them. And in fact, community groups even write handbooks on how to block a merger. Uh, you can download them off the web. Banks backward induct, and they partner with the community groups and agree to channel credit through them. But they don't want to hold those loans if they don't have to. And they tell the community groups, the activist groups, there's a limit to what we're going to do. The activists, particularly ACORN, but also uh, the Neighborhood Assistance, Neighborhood Assistance Corporation of America, go to Congress and they push, particularly ACORN. And there's Senate hearings in 1991. So this is a full decade before the investment banks get, it, get in. You know, the, the sort of story that people like to tell was Fannie and Freddie followed private banks. Well, they followed them in the sense that they're dragged in, kicking and screaming into this deal. They don't want to buy these loans, the CRA loans that banks are making. The activists push in Congress to basically make them do it. And the thing that the that Fannie and Freddie extract in return is two crucial features. First, they're going to be subject to regulation, not by the Fed. They're going to be subject to regulation by an, uh, a, a unit of, of housing and urban development. Their own regulator. Their own regulator, which, which has no experience. Bad. Which sounds bad, but it's actually... <laughs> Worse than it is. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds bad and it's worse. Yeah. Right? It's Good like a root them, canal. Good for them, bad for us, yeah. as it turned out. Second, they're given capital requirements that are about 60%, that is 40% below those for um, uh, commercial banks. They're allowed to be highly leveraged, but right. enormous. That revenue. means that Fannie and Freddie can get into the following business. You're a private bank, you're a, co a commercial bank, you sell me a loan. You had to put four dollars in capital behind that loan while you held it as a prudential reserve. I, as Fannie or Freddie, only have to put a dollar and sixty in capital behind that same loan because I have a different capital standard. Excuse me, two dollars and fifty cents behind that loan because I have a different capital standard. If I now create a mortgage-backed security out of a bunch of these loans that you sold me, Charlie sold me, and others have sold me, and and put a guarantee on it which I have to charge uh, uh, 45 cents per $100 for, I can now create a mortgage-backed security, essentially now being backed by $1.60 in, in capital against the mortgage-backed security plus the 45 cents to $2.05, and then sell it back to you. This creates tremendous incentive for me as, fan, or, uh, as a government GSE to be in the business of buying your bad loans and selling uh, it back. I understand. So I now I want it, so the banks only lead Fannie and Freddie into the extent that, the, that it's in their interest that Fannie and Freddie get into this business. Fannie and Freddie extract concessions. Later on, once this process is well underway, and once mortgage standards have been written, once this sort of basic game has been organized, that's when the investment banks get into the game. It is no accident that when the crisis occurred, well over half and perhaps as much as two thirds of all the toxic assets are sitting inside Fannie and Freddie. I don't know if that number is true. I know there's some controversy about it. The fact is, though, a lot of it's sitting inside – 
mm-hmm. privately run, not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act, privately invested in, highly leveraged investment banks like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, and some of it's even held by J.P. Morgan and, and Goldman, and people treat it like they were just, they were they stood aside, they didn't stay aside, stand aside, they also were doing it, they didn't do it as much. They were a little more cautious, but hundreds of billions of dollars of, of mortgage-backed securities were packaged, uh, they all had their own lending arms, they had their own uh, originators. So, Charles, how do you explain their... Um, let me, let me ask it a different way. Okay, so Fannie and Freddie could have gone broke because they made a lot of bad loans under the, this political pressure you're talking about, which I think is true. And it would have been a, some, it would have been expensive. But to get a collapse of the shadow banking system took something else, it seems to me. Don't you agree? Oh, well, the, there are really two different issues here. One of them is your first, your first question was, weren't there a lot of private players using their own money, these – Investment banks and Citigroup. Well, not their own money. Well, their stockholders' money. Yeah, kind of. And the taxpayers' money, yeah, both. Implicitly. Were, weren't yeah. they also making some decisions here? So yeah. let's let, uh, let. So that's one question. I want to turn to that. Then there's a second question. We've got about five more minutes. So yeah. let's. Try well, to get- I can I can do it pretty fast. So the key thing to recognize is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were the 800-pound gorilla in the mortgage market, and they were giving effectively what people regarded as a pretty good put option. In other words, they were the secondary market where mortgage-backed securities and mortgages could be dumped. They were, it, this was especially important if you talk to people in the industry for explaining why uh, there were so many violations of the various limitations on the portfolios that were being structured because as long as Fannie and Freddie were willing to give it a wink and a nod, it really didn't matter mm-hmm. what the rules were because you knew you could, you could sell these securities. The thing that people didn't really know was the total aggregate amount of crappy stuff that was being originated. And the reason that they didn't know it was because there was no correct aggregation going on that you could really turn to and figure it out. Only after we started seeing the default experiences in some of the categories of mortgages did we realize that they were effectively subprime quality. And the reason was because of the, starting in 2004, the, the rise of the so-called Alt-A, uh, non-documented mortgages. And we didn't really know how severe those risks were until we saw it starting in 2007. So, so people were actually very convinced that this, and that put option would have been good if there had only been half a trillion of these crappy mortgages. In fact, though, as we know from the SEC's settlement, with Fannie and Freddie, they were holding two trillion of those mortgages. And so that put option, as we know from having bailed them out, was no, no longer good. So I think a lot of the explanation for why private parties were willing to engage in this was they didn't realize that that put option was going to disappear. The, the second explanation, of course, and we do get into this in the book, is that actually you're partly right. That is, there was other stuff going on. It wasn't all the story that we're telling, but we think that that's the dominant sort of thrust of the story. There are other narratives out there having to do with monetary policy, which we think also contributed. But we think that that, that you wouldn't have had the two requirements to have a banking crisis, which are extreme risky assets that banks are holding and tolerance for extreme leverage of the banks and the GSEs if there hadn't been that political deal that underlay it all. And just one final sentence about this. The key thing is Fannie and Freddie, when they relaxed their underwriting standards, they didn't relax them just in the affordable housing area. They relaxed them Mm -hmm. for everyone. Because if they had said, we're just relaxing them in this area, they couldn't have defended it. They had to pretend that they were not doing something imprudent. And that's what opened the floodgates for everyone. I wish we could talk more about this, but we're almost out of time. So I want to try to uh, try to um, sum up a little bit, which is that 2008 was a really bad experience for the United States, lots of countries. Uh, how much of that was due to uh, bad social policy, um, expectations of, of creditor bailout, which I think is hugely important, which incentivized the investment banks and the GSEs and everybody to be imprudent with the money that they were able to borrow, which otherwise wouldn't have been able to borrow. Uh, we tried to fix it a little bit. Most economists think that our attempts to fix it were, have been a failure. Uh, 
mm-hmm. that we're standing on the edge of another crisis in the next X years. We don't know what X is, but <laughs> things are not good. Uh, where does that leave us? Um, a cynic would say, would say, well, you just have to, I just the way it is, we're just going to go from crisis to crisis. They seem to be accelerating, actually, uh, worldwide. Uh, do you have any reason for optimism and or do you have any uh, hope for a different set of political incentives? Because part of the theme of your book is this is the way it is, folks. You might wish you were otherwise. You might have a better idea, but the political incentives don't let you do it. So it doesn't really matter. So that can lead to um, a very unrosy view of the future. But I don't think that's your view. So one of you is an optimist and one's a pessimist. Which one's a pessimist? I'm more pessimistic than Charlie. <laughs> okay, you have to you go first because I want to okay. add on an optimistic note. No, I want, I, I want I to, never I, open up for q I want to be. I want to be clear, however, that the difference between us and optimism and pessimism is um, I say things that are pe- pessimistic and Charlie says things that are pessimistic, but he smiles more while he says it. <laughs> so um, one of the reasons why we wrote this book is not just because we wanted to understand how things work. We wanted the public to understand how things work. Good idea. And to be able to come away from reading this book with some heuristics for detecting when the financial system is heading off a cliff and they should start to become worried. Not just you know the public in general, but also financial journalists. And I think that I would I would end here by saying that if there's a lesson, there's two lessons that the public could extract from this book. It's first, if you're counting on your elected representatives to be watching out for your financial interests as an average taxpayer, think again. The second is that any time a politician tells you that he's found a way to create a free lunch and that there's going to be this marvelous subsidy and nobody's going to pay for it, reach for your wallet, especially when that subsidy is coming through the banking system. Because what's going to happen is what happened in the years leading up to 2008. It's not that I think the the Community Reinvestment Act was a bad idea. It's that the logic of the Community Reinvestment Act, coupled to the mega merger movement, gave rise to incentives for Fannie and Freddie to lower their underwriting standards. And once that happened, they had to lower them for everybody. The whole society could pile into deals that literally were too good to be true. So anytime, one of the reasons we wrote this book is to, is to make it clear to the public, anytime a politician says, I have a deal that's too good to be true, or what Bill Clinton called the third way, it's time to get very nervous and to think about voting for somebody else. And I would just add to that before letting Charles finish that uh, – the push in the 1990s through both Republican and Democratic administrations to raise the home ownership rate were always – there's always this footnote. And it won't cost us anything. anything. Uh, slightly um, overly optimistic. Yeah. Charles, finish this up. Oh. Well, I guess uh, what I would say to try to end on an optimistic <laughs> note is it is true that we can't just throw away our institutions and history and constitutions and pretend that we're Canada because that's not going to work. <laughs> but what we can do is – learn. And democracies do actually learn, even very populist democracies. So we've already mentioned that the UK, for example, became effectively a unicameral uh, legislature, no separation between executive and and, uh, the legislature. So we would say in some sense, very populist, um, and particularly after World War II, and they nationalized all their industry, and they had extremely high tax rates. Um, But that created some pressures on the economy. And in the 1970s and the 1980s, we saw extremely high inflation, very low growth. And guess what? It was unpopular. The rise of Margaret Thatcher was not just about Margaret Thatcher's leadership. It was about the fact that the median voter in that populist country was sick of it. And it's an interesting testament that the changes that were wrought under Thatcher have persisted and now are part of the mainstream status quo being endorsed by Miliband and others. Yeah. So it, I think the key thing is we're, we're, we're optimistic in the sense that we're spending a lot of effort hoping that the education of the people uh, eventually leads to some sort of positive response. It's very hard in finance because it's very arcane. It's very difficult. It's all too easy for politicians to give you the flim-flam. But um, let's be optimistic. Why not? 
and more educated readers after they read your book will be less susceptible to the flim flam. My guests today have been Charles Kellermaris and Steve Haber. Gentlemen, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you for Thank having you. Us. Okay, we're going to open up to Q&A, uh, and then we're going to have a little food and drink. Uh, uh, please, when you're um, called on, identify yourself by uh, name, if you could, uh, down here in the front, and use the microphone, if you could. Okay, I'm Arnold Kling. Um, I'm trying to figure sort of what makes Canada's banks stable, and the thing that comes to mind is charter value, that the you, know, you only have five of them, mm -hmm. and you know, they're profitable, and so they don't want to lose their charter, and maybe that stabilizes things. Uh, first of all, I wonder if that you know if, if you agree with that, and secondly, mm -hmm. if you do, um, what are the forces that keep that from happening in the U.S.? I mean, I think you mentioned you know the the, the populist sentiment: people don't want banks to be profitable, the government wanting to use banks um, you know for redistribution purposes. Is there a way that should we be trying to head toward a system where banks have valuable charters? Um, and if so, how could we head that way? Can I, I take a first stab at it? So, first of all, I want to be very clear here. Um, banks have charter value because for two reasons. One is because they run a business very well, and the other is because they are endowed <laughs> with some monopoly, non-competitive rights. In the case of Canada, there's a lot of evidence that the second is not true and has not been true, despite the small number of large banks. By the way, of course, there are thousands of banks in, in Canada, but there are only five that are very big. But if you, the literature on competition among the banks has uniformly found that the banks are extremely competitive. But there is an element of importance to what is being limited in the chartering in Canada, and that is the exclusion of the Yankees. That is a very important part, we believe, of the political bargain. And we, weren't, we aren't the first ones to have pointed this out. Because you look at it this way. The, first, the Canadian Banking Act is remade every five years. And the bank's charters expire every five years. Banks are on a fairly short leash in Canada in that sense. Also, part of the, the banking law effectively excludes U.S. banks and other foreign banks from competing on equal footing with the Canadian banks. So we think that that, that is a system that's very conducive to the banks also behaving well in the eyes of the regulator. And so long as the regulator is acting in the public interest, which it has consistently in Canada, that's also helping things. So I actually think that the exclusion, charter exclusion that really matters in Canada is not one that's creating monopoly rents within the domestic system, but one that's creating a vested interest of the Canadian banks in not messing up their deal to exclude the Americans. Any way to create some kind of charter value in the U.S., or you don't think that's a approach you would? Well, I think the, you know, so I, I have a, a recent paper on looking at charter values of U.S. banks, and most of it is dictated by whether they know how to run certain businesses better than other banks. There's, there's not really a lot of monopoly rent to be allocated. Uh, it's really about uh, being able to do your business relatively uh, in certain areas better than, than other banks. Another question? Yeah. Hi, Benjamin Kay. So my question is, so financial crises can be optimal in the sense that uh, – Perhaps the cost of stopping them is more uh, destroys real prevents real projects from being uh, funded, positive NPV projects from being funded. And so, uh, one thing that was not in the discussion uh, from the last hour was basically what, if any, price in terms of the efficient allocation of capital does Canada pay uh, for the for for the decisions that they make in the industrial organization of their banking industry? Good question. So you. This is an interesting question, and it creates a sort of technical problem because you have to be able to sort of model what Canada would look like if it had more expansive banking policies and therefore had sort of more volatility in credit. 
We can't observe that Canada. We can observe the Canada that does exist. And what has always struck me about Canada, that's an ex exaggeration. Um, it hasn't always struck me about Canada. It struck me uh, about Canada from the time I realized as a New Yorker that it was actually a separate country. Um, what has struck me about Canada is the fact that this is a country with a very small swath of land that you can actually grow anything on. You get 100 miles north of the border and, it, and it, it's too cold to grow anything. There are pockets of natural resources. Except hockey players. Except hockey players, right. Pockets of natural that. resources <laughs> sprinkled here and there, separated by vast differences, vast distances. Nevertheless, Canada is a country with a tremendously high GDP by, the, by world standards. And in fact, has accomplished that, even though it's a primary, mostly a primary product producer which means it's subject to big fluctuations in its terms of trade. A lot of that, I think, is due to the stability of the Canadian financial system. Um, so I'm I would be hard-pressed to make an argument that Canada could have done better had it had the U.S. financial system, which would have created or any much more volatility. Um, they've done remarkably well, given the resource base they have. Just to give you a sense of this, the state of Iowa has more farmland suitable for growing corn and wheat than the entire country of Canada. Right? This is so it's really remarkable what they've done, given the constraints they have. I want to just follow up with that question, now because I think it raises an important point that I wanted us to get to, which we didn't get to earlier, which is we have this obsession with never having any kind of crisis. And I think the right analogy is, is the forest fire analogy. So forest fires are unpleasant. They're awful. Things die. It's not good. You can, your house can burn down. You can, you can be killed. So there's a natural tendency to say forest fires are bad. We won't have any. When you do that, what happens <coughs> is, is that the kindling and tinder and other stuff, undergrowth, builds up to such an extent because there's never a forest fire that when a fire there eventually comes a fire that you can't put out. And it's so much worse than having a lot of little fires. And that's what we've done, I feel, with our financial system. We've tried to find the, we publicly say we're trying to find the perfect way to keep there from being any crises or distress. And as a result, it works really well until it doesn't. And then we have the Yellowstone fire, which is, a, 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 you know, an unbearable, unpleasant, uh, high cost situation. And I think that's uh, Arnold Kling asked the first question and says it the right way. We should have a system, you can't say as well as Arnold, but we should have a system that that uh, when it breaks, we can cope with it rather than one that never breaks. One that never breaks can't happen, but we have this ideal that that's going to happen, and it's a mistake. Any other questions? Yeah. Patrick Kennedy. Uh, so one of the themes I take it from the earlier part of the book is that federalism is not always function as a check and balance the way we think of it and that it prevents bad policies, but that sometimes it enables just other types of bad policies. And my question is, do you think that's uh, unique to finance, or as the country is debating kind of continually national government versus states' rights types of issues and health care and everything else, uh, is that unique to finance, or do you think this is a uh, you know more generalizable issue? It, it's a great question. Um, I think that it's not unique to finance, but I think it, it may be somewhat related to how complex the issues are in the particular area. Um, so it's interesting to me that um, one thing that, that we also discovered was that monetary policy in Canada has also been better than the United States. Um, in terms of the inflation <laughs> of the 1960s and 70s, its level and its volatility, Canada also managed to have a better experience there. I think in trade policy, you could also point to uh, superior outcomes in Canada relative to the U.S. So I'm not sure. It's, it's an, I do think that there are these general kinds of issues that apply to other policy areas, but um, I want to take them one at a time. I would answer that. I'd say I think that you framed a question for political scientists to address. I don't think that there is a consensus answer to that question because the question's never been framed quite the way you mm -hmm. put it. 
You, in most of the literature about federalism, it's all about market preserving federalism. Federalism is always good. Um, there's, there is this flip side of it, and I think it's, it's been under-researched. So I think that for, you know, graduate students thinking about a dissertation project, um, this would be a, a sort of a marvelous area to jump into. One last question. Anybody out there have one more question? Yeah. Todd Lindberg. So uh, when my European friends and interlocutors say this whole global economy mess is the fault of the United States of America, um, what is the short uh, answer to uh, – to that accusation. No, they have their own mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think... You wanted a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, short and true, the, the view that this is... That, that came out of this sort of boomerang thinking that everything kind of is traceable to the U.S. subprime crisis, I think is obviously wrong, um, and that the European problems have been brewing on their own for quite, quite some time. But I think there is some truth to the idea that the U.S. has done more than its share to destabilize uh, global finances over the last couple of decades. And on that cheerful note, we'll adjourn. I want to thank our, our panelists here, our authors. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.